Hey, is it Lisa? Lisa, why don't you just come and sing for us right now a pretty song? Been thinking about you. <laughs> this is my cousin who sings anything, can do anything, and she's wonderful. She's sung with a variety of groups and sings wonderfully by herself. What about it, Miss Lisa? Lisa Carlton, give her a hand. Yeah.
about Sister Helen? Are you in here? Sister Helen Stephan. Stephan. We have a, um, uh, a part of us up on the hill here that is a, it's a Moldovan Romanian church. And they're doing very well. And Sister Helen is a part of that. She's a part of us also. But anyhow, give her a hand, Sister Helen. actually have a couple songs for y'all. I have this one and another one. Um, and they both kind of talk about how God has a plan for us. And um, nothing that we go through and none of our situations, our circumstances, they, they're not there for nothing. They're there for a reason to teach us a lesson and God has a plan for us, a plan full of peace and prosperity. So the second song I have um, for tonight, it's called, um, 
Good Shepherd by Bethel Music. And so um, the second verse, uh, there were a couple of uh, just themes and Bible verses that popped into my head as I was um, on my way to church tonight. And I was just started thinking about these Bible verses and these uh, story from the Bible. So the first Bible verse that I thought of was Jeremiah 29, 11. And Jeremiah 29, 11 talks about how God has plans of prosperity and peace for us and not plans of evil or destruction or distraction, excuse me. Um, and that's kind of what this whole song talks about. It talks about God leading us and taking us by our hands and just guiding us through the waters. And um, another story that popped up into my mind is the story of Peter. Um, we all know that the disciples are out on the boat and um, there's a big storm going on and Jesus just came to them walking on the water. And Peter was the first one and the only one to get out of that boat and start walking on the water. And he, uh, as he kept his eyes on Jesus, he was walking on the water as if it were the ground beneath us right now. Um, but as soon as he took his eyes off of Jesus and started looking at his surroundings and his circumstances, he started sinking and he fell. And that's just a reminder in our daily lives to always keep our eyes on Jesus. In this storm, God walks on our problems and our situations. And as long as we keep our eyes on him, he will guide us and he'll make our storm still waters. Oh, 
about page 393? When we all get to heaven. You know, people from Georgia and Florida say, heaven with a B. Heaven. Stand up. Page 393. What's the first word? Hey, you're pretty good, pretty good. All right, brother, let's do it. Sing it now. Sing.
CLA. We love and appreciate him and all the work that he does. So everything that you give tonight goes to support his ministry. Brother Nelson, would you pray for us tonight?
else's horse, there's no one else to sing is what we were told. <laughs> They've sung all the good ones to death, so. That was good, wasn't it? It's been good all week. Don't wait on your favorite song or favorite singer or favorite sermon. Just jump right in. Worship in D. D is in there. I believe it in the church today. We're born accustomed to a lack of praise. Yeah. 
God during camp meeting, and, and I'm not saying just during our camp meeting, I think it's in camp meeting in general, and I try to think about why, why that is. If you were here this morning, you would know exactly what I'm talking about, and I, I really think it's because with camp meetings, any camp meetings that you go to, we, there's, there's always sacrifice involved, and I think that's really what, what makes the difference, in my opinion, and that's really how you evaluate, at least that's how I evaluate how good has camp meeting been, is do we feel that camp meeting wind blow through here? Do we feel that camp meeting fire and camp meeting presence? To me, that's the most important thing. The food might be good and it might make us clean some things up around here, but that don't mean nothing if the wind doesn't blow through here. And, uh, you know, some people might say, well, Hoy, I think the most important thing is that people get saved and people get blessed. That's all true, but that's not going to happen if the wind don't blow through. That's just the way it is. And so uh, I, I'm thankful I've felt the wind this week. I felt the Spirit of God. And so I'll sing this for you. Will, let me just tell you how the Lord gave it to me. Mom's had a difficult year physically and uh, a lot of trouble with her breathing. And um, so uh, several had tried to get her to go to the hospital. You all know my mom. Uh, I'm not being mean, but she's stubborn. That's just the way she is. That's the most polite, respectful way you can say it. So finally, she agreed to go, and we went down to the hospital. And uh, Robin was there, and Patty, and Angie, and me. And uh, they started to do some tests on her, and she needed to have some privacy for one of the tests. So I walked outside of the observation suite, and I walked around the corner. And uh, this is really the only time this has ever happened to me before. But as I started to, to pray to the Lord, it was almost like he was telling me what to pray to him. The um, Bible says the Holy Spirit will make intercession for you when you know not. And, and this is what he told me to say to him. This is what he told me to pray to him right there in that little hallway. He said, I need the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to come by this way. Oh, I need Jehovah. Cause what lie ahead was unclear Here's what I did I stepped outside And into the hallway And I lifted my eyes Heavens away Oh, and I started talking To the King of all glory This is what he heard me say Oh, I need the God of Abraham
song. Amen. What a song. Praise the Lord. Well, it's good to have Dr. David Gibbs here tonight. He works for CLA and has argued many cases before not only the Supreme Court, but different courts uh, for religious liberty. And you know, our liberties are being attacked today. And uh, we love him. We appreciate We pray for him. So would you make welcome tonight, Dr. David Gibbs, as he come to preach for us this evening. Thank you, Brother Will. Thank you. My soul. If the music didn't touch your heart tonight, I want you to hear me. You are a sick puppy. Whoa. If that didn't do something for you, you need number one to check. Are you saved? Because how you can hear that music as a child of God not have it reverberate in your soul. Wow. I've said this everywhere I go. I believe in America it should be perfectly legal to shoot a bad choir. <laughs> you ought to just be able to stand up and put them out of their misery. And you say, why would you say such a thing? Brother Will, you know, a choir can dig a hole no preacher can get out of. My soul was your choir anointed. Wow, yeah, don't, don't you for a moment. I hope you understand, there's a difference between talent and something that's anointed that's talented. And then my favorite quartet is listening right here. Oh, my soul. And then that, that last song. I just, if we went home right now, we'd have been in church. And I believe in the preaching, and I believe in the supremacy of preaching. But I'm telling you, if that music doesn't stir you, I wish you could sit on the platform and watch people. There's some folks when they're singing, they look like they're in misery. You know why? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Wow. Thank you, thank you for the privilege of letting us be here. And just what a joy. This has just touched my heart every which way. Turn in your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Tonight, for the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about something that's critical. It's your love life. You say you're going to talk about my love life. Yeah, yeah. You say, what well, that's kind of private. Yeah? But we're going to talk about your love life. Yes, sir, brother. Can I tell you what's happening across the sweep of our land right now? The love life of God's people in America is being squelched. Yeah. Yeah. How many of you figured out we're in a mess in this land? How many of you figured that out? By the way, how many of you figured out Washington's not the answer? It never was the answer. People come up to me all the time and say, Brother Gibbs, what can I do for my land? What can I do for America? If the Lord tarries is coming, what can I do for the babies in this land? And here's what I tell them. You get super active in your local church. Because the only hope America has is the word of God and the local church. That's it. Doesn't matter whether you're Republican, Independent, Democrat. Man, now we got socialists in there. Do you understand? We fought wars not to have that visited on us. And now we're voting it in. The hope of America is the Bible. Doesn't say the people rejoice when the conservatives bear rule. It says the people rejoice when the righteous bear rule. And what we need is God's power as never before. But when I talk about your love life, that's something that has evaporated. Doesn't matter which news outlet you watch, Fox, 
MSNBC, CBS, it doesn't matter which one. They're all upset. And they're all mad. And they want you mad about the stuff they're mad about. And if you're not mad about what they're mad about, then they're mad at you. <laughs> and yet the Bible has an absolute, unequivocal command governing your love life. Have you got the love life that God commands? Now, the Bible says in Hebrews 11, yeah. verse 6, without faith, mm -hmm. it is impossible to please God. Yeah. Now, listen just a moment. doesn't say it's unlikely. Yeah. doesn't say it's difficult. It says it is impossible yeah. to please him. Yeah. That's how you get saved. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. But now that you're saved, God says, I'm commanding you to do everything by faith. But then the Bible makes this statement. There's something that matters more to God than faith. Now, that's hard for me to wrap my mind around. But I want you to read what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. Now abideth faith, boy, there's that thing, without it we can't please God. Hope, charity. These three. But the greatest of these is not hope. God says there's something more important than faith. But the greatest of these is charity. I trust you know from your Bible what the word charity there means. It's the word agape. It's the word for a love that only God can produce through you. In the Bible, there's three words for love, and let's make sure you got the right one, because, boy, we're living in a culture that just loves the word love. I walked in a motel the other day, and I walked up, and I said, oh, we love you. We're so glad you're here. They don't even know me. They don't love me, they love my credit card. That's what they love. <laughs> but they just want to use that word to warm you up. The first word for love, and this is the one the world uses 90% of the time, is the word eros. We get the word erotic from it. It's the physical attraction. A young man gets interested in a young lady and he says, I think maybe I'm falling in love. He better be careful he's not just physically attracted. You know what the problem is with being physically attracted? It keeps changing. I used to love you, but what I fell in love with didn't look like this. So now, I want somebody else. You never did love that person. You were just heiressing. Oh, listen, the reason the divorce rate is out the roof is because people say we're in love yeah. and they don't know what they're talking about. The second word for love in the Bible, number one is eris, number two is filio. Right. That's just the love of a kind person. Right. 
And we get the word philanthropic from it. Of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Have you ever met somebody? They may be saved, they may not be, but they're just nice. And you say, oh, what a nice, loving person. Wow. You know what the trouble with that is? As long as they're nice, then you love them. But what happens when they stop being nice? I love the police till they pull me over for speeding. Do you not understand? I'm about the Lord's work. I must do it with haste. And it doesn't impress them at all. And when they find out I'm a lawyer, they say, you're going to jail. You're, that's where you're going. Oh, listen. God doesn't command you to Eris. And he doesn't command you to Philio. The word for love in the Bible is agape. For God so loved the world. Agape. The scripture commands you walk in the spirit. Do you know what the first fruit of the spirit is? Love. If you don't have this love in your life, you're not close to walking in the Spirit. Because God says, this is a love you don't produce. This is a love the Holy Spirit in you produces. Wow. When I ask, how's your love life? What's your answer? Now turn to the book of John. And we're going to come back to 1 Corinthians. But I want you to look at John for just a moment. John chapter 13, verse 34. Jesus, to his followers and to his disciples, he says, a new commandment I give unto you, yes, sir. that ye love one another. And it's the word agape again. I, 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 I'm not, this is something only God in you can do that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Now look at what he says in verse 35. By this, this love, shall all men know ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. You know what he says? This love is so powerful that everybody's going to know who you belong to when they see this love. I don't answer out loud. Would someone say, that lady's got something. I'm telling you, that's of God. That love. That man has something. That love. Now, I want you to look at some warnings. Go back to 1 Corinthians 13 again. In the first three verses of the chapter, God gives us some startling warnings. Here's what he thinks of this love. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, agape love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. That verse should alarm you and me. You know what a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal is? It's the irritating noise that merchants make in the marketplace. If you go to the old marketplace in Israel, you see they screech and they howl and they cackle with their voices. It's like fingers on a blackboard. It's horrible. That noise trying to get your attention is called a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Here, don't, you know what God just said? If you don't have this love, you're nothing but an irritating noise in America. Hmm. 
I wonder how many days I've been an irritating noise. The other day we had a car pull up next to us. Our windows were up, their windows were up. But man, it was boom boxing in that car. The vibration was coming down, across, and up into our car. How many of you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> That's you. That's me. Without this love, the God you serve, it's not the world that says you're irritating. God says you're irritating. If the Lord was here in a form we could see, and we'd say, go up and down the aisles and point out the irritating noises. <laughs> what would happen when he got to you? This is serious. Look at what he says in the next verse. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and boy, underline this next, and though I have all faith, not great faith, all faith, so that I could remove mountains. And by the way, how many of you would be impressed if I could move mountains? I sure would be. <laughs> and have not charity, say out loud the next three words. I am nothing. Now this is God commenting on Christians. God says, without this, I'm just an irritating noise. And God says, if you don't have this, David, what you're doing for me is a nothing. Look at the third thing he says. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, not some, all. And though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, this love, it profiteth me, what's the next word? Nothing. I wonder how much giving I've done that didn't count. You just remember this, the heart you put it in with counts ever bit as much to God as what you put in. God says, without this love, it counts nothing. How's your love life? Have you got the love that only the Holy Spirit of God can produce through you? Now, I've got good news for you. God wants you to have this love. When he says walk in the spirit, and then you get down just a little bit further in Galatians 5, and he says, and the fruit of the spirit is, and the first one, love. God never commands what God won't enable. But you hold the decision trigger. You hold the trigger whether you are going to love by the power of the Holy Spirit or whether you're going to pass. Now, he gives us some indicators to tell us how we can judge this love. Look at verse 4. He says, this love, if you've got it, he said, this love suffereth long. You know what suffereth long means? You can't wear it out. Doesn't matter what you do to it, you can't wear it out. That's it. I've had it. I'm sick and tired of you. I'm fed up. I've already put up with way too much. I was out of my mind to put up with as much of you as I have. I'm done. This love never says that. Never. You can't wear it out. How many of you know the world's full of irritating people? Hold your hand up if you know that. How many of you know some irritating people? How many of you got some in your own family? How many of you sitting next to one right now? Look at the hands, okay. They're everywhere. And you know what I've discovered? They all want to know me. And they all want to know you. Because the devil knows what that says. You see, you can't wear this love out. You can't do it. Oh, you can wear out Eris in a heartbeat. 
You can wear out filial easily, but you can't wear out the love of God. Have you got that? A young couple surrendered to go to the mission field. Jim and Elizabeth Elliott, they wanted to go to Ecuador to reach the headhunters. An incredibly dangerous mission field. These headhunters had already driven the oil workers out. The oil companies had pulled back because with their spears they learned how to foil the blades on the choppers and bring them down. And when they caught you, they ate you. But they felt called of God to go. She's pregnant with their first child when they arrive on the field. And Jim Elliott and a man by the name, name of eight, Nate Sense, excuse me, Nate, give me the next name. <laughs> Nate Saint came together. And they had a small plane. And they went up into the jungles to find the headhunters, and they found them. And the headhunters feigned friendship and called them in. When they landed their plane, they savagely attacked them, and they killed them. But they didn't kill them quickly. They roasted them over a fire for 10 days that made them wish they were dead for 10 days. Word came back to the headquarters that the men had been martyred. And the missionaries went to Elizabeth and said, do you want to go home? Do you want to go to another field? What do you want to do? She said, no. I want to go reach these men that killed my husband. And they said, they're savages. She said, I know, but I love them. You what? You can't wear this love out. She said, I want to regroup for a moment. And they said, well, if you're going back in there, we'll get the army. And she said, no. You send the army, they'll just take flight into the forest. I just want to go with some other missionaries. She said, we knew it was dangerous but we're called of God and we love them. Would you love somebody who did that to you? You can't wear this love out. I had the privilege to speak on platforms with Elizabeth Elliot numerous times, many times. And I asked her, did, did that night frighten you? She said, no, it terrified me. She said, I'm no fool. But she says, when you decide you love them with God's love, nothing stops you. Elizabeth and a few other missionaries went up to the very place, got the same heathens who killed her husband. And miraculously, when they arrived, their presence terrified these headhunters. They said, where did you get the courage to come stand in front of us? Do you not understand how fierce we are, how powerful we are? Do you not understand what we did to your husband? She said, I understand. But I love you. By this shall all men know who you belong to. Yeah. The chief, who three days later was saved and is now the pastor of that church, he said, for 10 days we tortured your husband over fire. And for 10 days all he kept saying was, Jesus loves you and I love you. We couldn't make him stop saying it no matter what we did to him. 
What does it take to make you stop? Better question, what does it take to make you start? How's your love life? Elizabeth Elliot led them to the Lord. I had the privilege to meet that chief. And I said, talk to me. He said, do you have any idea how powerful the love of God is when it's coming through somebody? He said, we understood hatred. And we understood savagery. But we didn't understand that. And we didn't know what to do with it. Whoa. You can't wear this love out. Mom, would the kids say, Mom loves everybody. Mom, getting rid of something? No, uh -uh. Mom would never do that. She's got the love of God in her. Dad, he's got the love of God. A while back, a man wrote a very nasty letter about us. This is some years ago now. And it was full of terrible lies, terrible. He never talked to us, but he wrote this letter, and then he sent it out. And all of a sudden, my friends are calling, saying, this letter isn't true, is it? And I said, no, it's not true. Of course not. And I got mad. I got ticked off. How many of y'all have ever gotten ticked off? Hold your hand up. I got ticked off. And so I decided to get even. It came out on a Friday. Friday night, I decided I'm going to sue him once a day, every day for 30 straight days. You want to play word games? Bring it on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you regret the day you were born. And I felt wonderful. <laughs> I went out that weekend to be in a church and present the ministry. And man, I'm just, I felt great. I'm going to make this guy scream uncle like you can't imagine. <laughs> and I told all the lawyers, I want you in the office at 1 o'clock because if you can come up with more ideas how to nail this buzzard, I want to hear them. And I'm telling you, I felt good. He started it. I'm just finishing it. <laughs> I came walking in our office, got an early flight. I came walking in about 1030. And when I came walking in, there was my secretary, Mrs. Block. She's been to this meeting. Yeah. She's with the Lord now. But Shirley walked up to me and she said, boy, I saw that letter. I said, yeah. She said, that's awful. I said, I know. She said, that's all lies. She said, I've been here 20 plus years. There's not one thing in there that's the truth. I said, I know. She said, well, I know what you're going to do. I said, yes, yeah, surely I'm going to sue him once a day, every day, for 30 straight days. And she said, no. You're going to love him and bless him and do good to him and forgive him aren't you? <laughs> and I said, yeah. <laughs> right after I get even. <laughs> what she did next blew my mind. Turn to Matthew, the book of Matthew chapter 5. She quotes me scripture. Oh, my goodness, I wasn't ready for it. Matthew 5, verse 43. You have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. By the way, there's the gold standard for the world. You treat me right, I'll treat you right. But you treat me like dirt, we're done loving. But I say unto you, from the lips of Jesus, say out loud the next three words. Love your enemy. Say them out loud louder. 
love your enemies. Turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor you're commanded to love your enemies. Tell your neighbor right now. Yeah. Hmm. Oh. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. She quotes me that verse by heart. Now when she did that, I didn't say this out loud, but I, I thought, Lord, I do not need a Christian secretary right now. I just don't. <laughs> and I really don't need one that knows the Bible. Do you know what? The world thinks that's crazy. But now the churches are full of Christians who think it's crazy. And it's a direct command of Scripture. She said, Brother Gibbs, if you do what you're saying, you'll be worse than him. You have to love him. She said, promise me you're not going to sue him. I said, okay. She said, well, I knew you'd want to do what was right. You'd want to tell him you love him. So when I saw you pull up, I dialed him on the phone. <laughs> and he's on line five right now. And I look down and line five is just a blinking away. She picks it up. Now, Shirley was from West Virginia, but she had Italian in her background. And when she wanted you to do something, she'd say, Tell him you love him. And I looked at her and I said, leave me alone. <laughs> Boy, I was in agony. She hands me the phone. Tell him you love him. I said, hello. That's all I said. Hello. The guy cussed me out. This so-called religious leader cussed me out terrible. All I said was Hello. He's, I said, you hear that, Shirley? Let's go back once a day, every day, 30 straight days. And once we fixed him, then we'll do it. She said, no. Tell him you love him. Whew. Finally, he stopped cussing. I said, I just want you to know I called to tell you I love you. He said, you don't mean that. I thought, boy, are you dead right. <laughs> Can I warn you? Yeah. Don't try to do this in your flesh. Because you can't. But by the power of God in you, you absolutely can. I said, I want to tell you something. You're a bad man. But I'm worse than you. What you did to me hurt us but I decided to hurt you far, far more. But I ran into a Christian secretary who reminded me what the Bible says. You are commanded to love your enemies. Yeah, but Brother Gibbs, no, no, no. You are commanded. Please hear this. There is no such thing as a good Christian who doesn't do this. So when I ask, how's your love life? You can't imagine how important that question is. Look at the next thing he says. Charity suffereth long and is kind. You know, one thing you can't hide is kind. Well, I'm kind, it just doesn't show. No way in the world. You can't hide kind. You can tell kind. A young man by the name of Paul Cooper, he just graduated from high school. He's on his way to Bible college. Surrendered to be a preacher 
great, great young man, fervent soul winner. But he got a little bump on his gum, and he went to the dentist, and the dentist said, I, I don't think it's dental. I think you need to see a doctor. And he went to see a doctor, and the doctor ran tests, and he said, you've got the extreme advanced stages of leukemia. They did everything they could, everything they could, bone marrow, everything they could. But Paul's dying. He's not going to make it. I went to visit him several times in the hospital, preacher, and one time I was there and his parents were just exhausted. And I said, would, would you let me stay with him tonight? The one thing I can do is stay up all night and I'd love to do that to help you. I'd love to be with Paul. Now, Paul is so sick. They can't make his gums stop bleeding. He's bleeding out the corners of his eyes. He's hurting bad. His parents walked out. They said, oh, you're an answer to prayer. He said, I need your help. I said, what do you need, Paul? He said, I need you to get me out of this bed. I said, get out of the bed? For what? He said, I want you to get a wheelchair. I want you to get me in it. And one floor down, there's a whole floor of kids that are dying. My, oh my. And what kind of Christian would I be, he said, if I didn't love them? And get down there to witness to them one time. I said, Paul, I, I think you're too sick, son. He said, no, 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 we'll make it, we'll make it. He said, I love them, Brother Kitch, but I need your help. He said, they, they won't let me out, but you're a lawyer, and if, if you threaten to sue them, they'll let me out. That's what he said. <laughs> I said, Paul, he said, Brother Gibbs, I'm dying. But I love these kids down there. You gotta help me get there. What's the last time love propelled you? I went to find a wheelchair. And I ran right into a nurse and she said, what are you doing? I said, I need this wheelchair. And she said, why? I said, well, I just need it. <laughs> and she said, why? I said, it's a complicated story. But I said, let me tell you, I grew up, my mom got polio. And I lived around wheelchairs my whole life. And I can balance in two wheels on a wheelchair. And, and I just want to use this wheelchair for some stuff. She said, you're lying. You can't balance. I said, watch me. So I leaned back on it and balanced on two wheels. I said, you got any other questions? She said, no, so I took the wheelchair. <laughs> now I go and get Paul. He's got all these bottles and drips. and He's in so much pain. I said, Paul, are you sure? He said, I'm positive. I love him. Help me. I said, okay. I'm finally getting them situated, and in walks that nurse. <laughs> she said, I knew you were up to something. Now, Paul, bless his heart. He looked at the nurse, and he said, you mess with him, he'll sue you. <laughs> She said, you wouldn't. I said, you're the one who gave me the wheelchair.
And I said, I'd hate to see your career end tonight, but <laughs> now help me. And so she did. Paul couldn't hold his head up. So he strapped it back. Went down one floor. Walked into the first room. I'm just here to tell you I love you. And I got a God who loves you. And I'm dying too. But I know where I'm going. Yeah. We just went room to room. Love is kind. I finally, after a couple hours, got Paul back and his doctor came up. And he said, are you the guy that took him down a floor? I said, yeah. He said, the whole hospital's talking. What kind of love? would make a boy so sick, go do that? That's a great question. What kind of love would make you do it? Hmm. Now abide at faith, yeah. hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is this love that only God can produce. Well, Brother Gibbs, this is all real easy for me. Move right on. If it is, would you remember me in prayer? Because I have to keep reminding myself. You'll never do this by accident. You won't wake up one morning and say, well, it must have happened in the night. I'm loving the way God's commanded me to. Remember, without it, I'm a nothing, and so are you. Go back to 1 Corinthians, now chapter 14, verse 1. Let's read verse 13 of 4. Now, by the faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Look at the next command. Follow after charity. The word follow there was the word for an absolute passion pursuit. It was the word for something you prioritize with an unequivocal passion. That's what your God says. Follow after charity. I promise you our nation needs to see some of this love. Yeah. Our homes need to see it. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. Follow after charity. Last week's gone. Praise God for this camp meeting. And I love the way he said it. Boy, the camp meeting fire. That's the spirit of God moving through. Now tonight... Are you ready to start loving the way your God commands yeah. you to love? With a love that can never be worn out. It suffereth long and is kind. Bow your heads. Father, oh my, by your grace, by your power, we want to show this world what our God can do. The love of God so rich and pure. Heads are bowed. How many of you say, David, God spoke to my heart. I want that love. Amen. I want that in my life. If that's true, hold your hand up right now. Hold your hand high. God spoke to my heart. Hold your hand up. If you raised your hand, I want you to get up out of your seat and make your way to this altar. Don't hesitate. Don't delay. You come right now. No one does what's right when they leave. If we don't do what's right when God speaks to our heart. Brother Gibbs, I just don't see how I can love my enemies. You can't, but the Spirit of God through you can. Oh, I promise you, for the sake of your kids, for the sake of your testimony, for the sake of the cause of Christ, oh, may we be the ones.
by God's grace, who love, who love. Father, I sure bow with these people. I bow my heart with their hearts. God, we're living in a day when everything is selfish. No wonder it's called the Me Too. It's all based on self. God, by your grace, by your power, we want to love the way you've commanded us to love. Without it, we're nothing. But with it, the whole world's going to know who we belong to. God, I don't know what challenges are in these lives. All I know is everybody has challenges. And by God's grace, by your power, we want to start loving the way we're commanded to love. Hear our cry in Jesus' name. Let's all stand together, please. He's going to lead us in a hymn of invitation.
remember this tonight. This love matters to God more than faith. And he says, without faith, you can't do one thing to please me. Boy, does that put this love on a pinnacle scale. And it doesn't cost money to do it, but it takes a decision. I promise you, the devil doesn't care if you heard this tonight as long as you don't do anything with it. In fact, I think I can show you from Scripture that he loves it when we're hearers but not doers. Who are you going to love? How many of you know the name Lester Roloff? I had defended him in trials 14 times. And we were in a trial, and the lawyer on the other side just hated him with a passion. Cussed at him. I mean, kept saying, I'm going to destroy that preacher. And this lawyer and I, man, we had some real face-to-face tease-off in the courtroom. Boy, we just went at it. One morning we showed up, and it was just the preacher and me and this lawyer. And Brother Roloff did a strange thing. He walked over by this lawyer. And he said, I just want to tell you something. I love you. I almost fell over when he said it. (laughs) This guy is doing everything he can to destroy you, to put you in jail. He said, I'm praying for you to get saved. He said, I want you to know that you could be another Paul if you just get saved. You could really be used of God. And he said, I love you, and I wonder, would you let me hug you? And I thought, I'll hug him for you. (laughs) Oh, I was seething. He stood up, and he looked at the preacher, and he said, there's nobody loves me. He said, I got three prior wives. None of them do. He said, I got kids who won't even talk to me. And you're telling me you love me. Brother Roloff said, my God commands it. I do love you. Now be careful. Don't you try to fake this. It's got to be real. That lawyer started to cry and Brother Roloff hugged him. And he said, I'm looking forward to seeing you in heaven. And he gave him a gospel tract. And we walked, he walked over and I thought, man, I don't know that I want him in heaven. I mean, this is a bad dude. You know what Reverend Roloff did? He looked at me and he said, David, until you can love him, you're going nowhere with God. The problem's not him, son, it's you. Because until you love him the way you're commanded, you're a nothing. Turn to your neighbor right now and tell your neighbor, I'm done being a nothing. Tell your neighbor, I'm done being a nothing. (laughs) Tell your neighbor, I'm going to start loving the way I'm commanded. Tell your neighbor, I'm going to love the way I'm commanded. And now tell your neighbor, and I want you to start loving the way you're commanded. Because tell him, I've noticed you don't do it. Oh, listen. This is so easy to see in someone else and such a struggle to see in ourselves. I promise you, by the grace of God, we can see major things happen if we start loving the way God's command us to love. Be seated one minute. Every month, our ministry sends out a newsletter. How many of you get our newsletter? Hold your praise the Lord. It's free. It's free. But we ask this. Will you give me one minute a month in prayer? You have no idea how I covet that prayer. If you would look at the lawsuits that we have on the docket right now, the lawsuits against pastors, against moms and dads and youth workers and students and Christian businessmen and on and on, If you'd look at them all, 
the countries, the wheels are falling off. We need you to pray. How many of you believe God's still in the prayer answering business? He is. But you know what he said? You have not because you asked not. Now, when you're sued, we're going to be begging people to pray for you. But right now, we're begging you to pray for others. Please, when that envelope comes, pray. I'm not asking for a minute a day, a minute a month. But pray for those lawsuits. People come up to me all the time and say, man, those lawsuits are so interesting. And I always caution them, a lawsuit's only interesting if it's not your lawsuit. <laughs> when it's your lawsuit, it's a frightening event. Please, church, pray. Ushers, come on forward. How many of you say, David, I don't get your newsletter, but send it to me. I'll give you one minute a month. Ushers, stand up. Hold your hand up, would you? We want to put one in your hands. And the minute you get that, fill it out. The minute you get it. Please don't put that in your purse. Uh, what goes in a lady's purse is never seen again. It's a goner. And guys, more deadly is the flyleaf for your Bible. It will be gone. Fill that envelope out, and I need you to print. There's no cost. All we need is an address, but we have to have a zip code so that we can mail it to you. Please fill that out and we're gonna have you hand it to the ushers on the way out the door. By the way, we also have back there a Bible bookmark for everybody, every man, woman, and child, and would you put it in your Bible, and when you see it, breathe a prayer for the lawsuits. Uh, I just had a pastor's wife on the phone, sobbing. She said, I can't believe this is happening to us. And the last words were, please get people to pray. When you're sued, we'll be begging others to pray for you. Please, God's the answer. Anybody still need an envelope? We don't want to miss anybody. Right up here, this precious lady. Thank you, ma'am. Right there to your right. They got you. Please fill that out. Would you print? Somebody's got to be able to read it. And uh, many of you, your handwriting is like mine, borderline hieroglyphic. Okay. Please, please. I want to close by reminding you that sometimes the devil knows how to creep in and get us to not love because something happens spontaneous. And all of a sudden you forget. Uh, I'm not a morning person. How many of you are morning people? Hold your hand up. I ought to be legal to shoot you, dear people. <laughs> My wife's a morning person, 5 a.m., boy, she's up and at it. By the way, that's one of the things in heaven, no night. So there'll be no morning. Wow. I'm catching a quarter to six, a 545 flight, and I got on an airplane. And they put a new interior in this airplane. And the seats were unbelievably cramped and small. Uh, the seats on these airplanes are ridiculous now. Uh, when I look at them, I think, I don't need a seatbelt. I really don't. <laughs> Once I'm wedged in, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> you know that little deal in the event of an emergency? If there's an emergency, me and this seat will leave together. <laughs> we'll be out of here. And, and what I hate about it, as bad as it is this way, there's no leg room this way. When the guy in front of you leans back, you could trim his nose hair or something. I mean, he's in your lap. But I'm looking at these seats, and the plane is just filling up with folks. And I turned to the flight attendant there. I didn't say one thing about her. I criticized the seat. I said, those are the most puny seats I've ever seen. It's quarter to five in the morning, or quarter to six in the morning, 5.45. I didn't say anything about her. She lit off. I said, those are the most puny seats I've ever seen. She said, well, you could lose weight, you know. I thought, oh, sweet Alabama. I got the mouth of the South. But when she said that, boom, 
She said, you can lose weight, you know. I said, you know what, you're right. You could get prettier. <laughs> I said, you are one of the most seriously cosmetically defective people I've ever seen. I said, I don't know how to tell you this, but when you fell out of the tree, you didn't miss a branch. <laughs> now the people around me are clapping. <laughs> a businessman there got his pen out and he said, write that down, I wanna get that out, where'd you get that? <laughs> hey, she started it. <laughs> she got a little teary and went, walking off, and I went to put my coat up, and when I did, some tracks slid out of my pocket. <laughs> now, I'm on my way to do a trial that day, and I start out sinning. Hmm. Have you ever gotten upset in rush hour traffic? I went back up by that lady and I said, what I did to you, my God forbids, love your enemies. Nothing can take the place of this love. Follow after charity. God bless you, church. Amen, let's stand together. We'll be dismissed in prayer. Don't forget tomorrow morning, Scotty will start at 10 a.m. And Tammy Jones Robinette will be singing for us. My brother Sean will be preaching for us. Amen. So we hope you'll stop by. Make you go by, see all the uh, different CDs and different things of the groups. Uh, Soup Man's out on the youth building. Stop by and see him as well. Let's be dismissed in prayer. And we'll see you tomorrow. Saturday. We're going to be off Saturday. So if you have an uh, 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 urge to go, we're going to have a sing.